I hired people that were way more senior than I was. So I think everyone on my team, with one exception, um, is 15 to 20 years at least my senior. We're all about turning a crappy situation into something about positive. A quarter million dollars of credit card I debt. I still remember the day when no one turned up. Throw it in the garbage and start from scratch. I could give myself a chance, so I started something. I mean, I think that counts as from poop to gold. <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back to From Poop to Gold. I'm Daniel Harmon, Chief Creative Officer at Harmon Brothers and your host. And my guest today is Diane Strutner. Welcome, Diane. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. So Diane is CEO and co-founder of DataZoom. Correct. Tell us a little bit about what DataZoom is. Yeah, so DataZoom is a uh, data middleware platform and we have created something that's focused on the vertical of video and media and basically uh, my goal was to be able to use one line of code to capture all of the data you need about video playback and video streaming okay. uh, to send that to any tool you wanted to use. So basically okay. we pull data in, uh, we push it through a process that uh, uh, adds in some standards and we can transform data so it can be used by other tools and then we send it out to other tools, things like data warehouses and analytics tools. So it's like a catch-all of all the data uh -huh. associated with the playback and the streaming, uh -huh. and then it basically makes that data digestible yes. and pushes it over to where it's needed. Exactly. Am I kind of capturing that, that right? Is, that's very accurate. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Good a, job. <laughs> a non-techie <laughs> explanation of what data zoom is. Yeah. Okay. Um, now... If you guys hear weird sound stuff, it is it's it's like Diane mentioned. We are at a show, so just apologize for the the audio blips here and there that aren't our voices. Um, but bear with us because we're going to get to some really good stuff. Um, can you kind of give us a little bit of a backstory? How did how did you end up to where you're now, co-founder, CEO of this tech company? Mm -hmm. Like. Take us through that process. It was, you know, an around the world journey. So <laughs> as I said, I grew up in the Bay Area, went to school out in New York, and I studied in Barcelona. Uh, I studied abroad in Barcelona, I should say. Okay. And I'm falling in love with Barcelona. And when I graduated school, I was like, I really want to come back here. This place is awesome. You've got, you know, beautiful beaches and a lot of fun stuff to do. Yeah. So anyways, um, I started working. I moved. I did move to Barcelona, like right after I graduated and started working in some small tech startups over there. Okay. And uh, eventually um, got into my previous company. It was a video analytics company. Okay. And I did the go to market for a brand new video analytics product. And I did not know anything about the video space um, but I knew I could uh, sell okay. I knew I could you know source attention and for, yeah. I guess for as a salesperson if you make all your money on commission you need to understand if you're gonna be actually able to make any money selling this so yeah. I knew my first couple weeks my whole goal was to try and get as many meetings as I could and see the customer reaction to the product mm -hmm. and that could use that to gauge what I would think would be my own success in this. So um, as a long story short, uh, this company was based out of Spain. I had a lot of responsibility to um, pitch, you know, VP and C-level technology executives yeah. about this video technology, sorry, video analytics solution that I was selling. And over the course of a couple years, I'd had, you know, a couple hundred conversations, let's say, and I realized that everyone actually was asking for, asking the same questions and really wanting the same thing that I thought was a bit different than what, you know, my previous company was offering. Okay. So uh, I set out to, you know, essentially everybody wanted to have access to raw data because okay. raw data has to be used for a lot of different things within video, not just analytics like what I was selling. Okay. Um, they wanted this data to be able to be sent to all of those different places. So they're continually asking if we could integrate with other different systems. So it needed to be something that could be support an ecosystem. And then lastly, they wanted data in real time. And I think a big, as we know, like video streaming happens on a second to second basis. When you hit play, you want that video to get there. The challenge with data which is used to understand operations and things like that for video streaming is that there's a ton of delay that we add onto it today. So we can actually use data to power newer technologies like machine learning driven technologies that can actually help fix video streaming. And so I wanted to create kind of a new foundational layer of data in the space that could be used for anything, but specifically with the hope of applying it towards machine learning driven technologies. So, so essentially you're going out and you're selling this product and you're realizing this doesn't actually provide the solution Right. That they are looking for. Yes. Well, first off, how's, <laughs> like when you're in a job and you realize all of a sudden, oh, I don't actually have what they need. What's, what's that like when you have that realization? So I actually had that 
I never thought, th I thought that it was kind of fake, but I actually had that aha moment happen to me. I was talking with a customer uh -huh. in this meeting and I knew that if we just were able to get data into our analytic system that they would like our dashboard system better. Uh -huh. And so I said, you know, what if we could use one line of code to capture all the data we need for any tool you wanted to use? Yeah. And they were like, oh, that'd be great. We would buy that from you right now. And I was like, well, this is a new reaction. I've definitely not had this before. Uh -huh. And I guess from that point on, it was kind of a rapid succession of like reviewing in my head all these conversations I had and seeing the, you know, repetitiveness of the feedback I'd always gotten and realized that there was a new industry that needed to be formed. And, you know, part of the challenge at DataZoom, uh, even in trying to explain it to you or explain it to anyone, actually, is that it is a new category. We've created yeah. a new software category. So there's not like, you know, someone else that we can point yeah. to. Yeah, we're the Uber of yeah. this. Exactly. No, you're not. <laughs> right? Exactly. exactly. It's, okay. So did you try to did you try to the company that you're working for? You don't uh -huh. have to cite what it was or whatever, but like you were you were selling that product. Yep. Did you try to go back and say this is actually what we need to develop? This is what we need to make, or did you just say to yourself, no, I? Were you just immediately like, oh, I've got to just got to start my own company? Or I think <laughs> it was that because it's too divergent from what they were trying to do. Okay. Right? So I think one of the challenges with many companies is you try and do too many things at once. Yeah. And this is really foundationally trying to accomplish a different goal. Okay. So uh, that process was really interesting. I basically ended up making a few phone calls because I had great relationships with a lot of executives who I would supposedly be selling to in the space. Yeah. I basically called them and said, hey, this is my idea. Um, do you like it? Uh -huh. uh, would you buy it? Uh, should I do it? Uh -huh. And everyone said yes, yes, yes. Okay. And so actually I quit. I put in my resignation uh, a week later on my oh, wow. 27th birthday my gosh. and said, you know, I'm leaving and start this company. And this, you know, journey began. And um, I was living, I was kind of splitting time between New York and Barcelona. I'd opened my previous company's New York office. And so, you know, I was tired and it was like, oh my God, I'm giving so much for this company. And when I had this idea, I was like, wow, this is something that I can kind of do for myself. You yeah. know? And I was excited about that. Um, and it was re-energizing. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so I started this journey and I have to say like, you know, podcast from Poop to Gold, um, it's definitely been quite a ride, right? And so- Yeah, because you're, you're not a coder. I'm not a coder. So my yeah. challenge was I had this great idea and I needed to, you know, find um, a team that would build this product for me that I could then go sell. So there was that, you know, that important thing in the middle and a lot of challenges that came with that, right? And so I actually, I, I co-founded DataZoom with a friend of mine, uh, JT, and we're still very good friends. Um, he ended up stepping out a few months into this uh, and he was my CTO. He was a guy that was going to help build this product. So I had to go, you know, at some point, I guess five months into it, six months into it, say, I need to go replace this guy with someone else. And so I'd actually found a new CTO. Um, but and he, he was your co-founder. My, my co-founder. My co-founder stepped out. So now I'm like trailblazing alone at this point. Yeah. Right? Um, so I had to go find a new CTO and I hired another guy. I brought him on. He started working for a few months and unfortunately it didn't work out. And that happens Gosh. again. So it's like two strikes. And I knew, you know, I'd now I think it was probably September, October of 2017. And um, I was like, okay, there's not many people that can do this job. And I actually spent a couple weeks scouring through LinkedIn, mm -hmm. trying to find some people. And I actually only identified two individuals that I think would have actually done this. On I mean, the planet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like from anyone that I could have found. I spent yeah, okay. like probably 200 hours on LinkedIn oh, wow. looking for people. And so one of them um, uh, became an advisor and an investor in DataZoom. And the okay. other one is my current CTO, Michael, who is amazing. And I tell everyone that, you know, everything works out for the best. Um, and I think it totally did in this case with Michael. He's done an amazing job building our team, building our technology. Um, and it's, you know, shows like this that you go speak with some of the leaders in the space and people say, wow, what you're doing is really cool and really needed, yeah. really important. Um, and I couldn't do that without him. So take yeah. us through a little bit of that emotional journey of what that was like when all of a sudden you had a CTO and then you didn't, and then you had a CTO and then you didn't like what, like what was at stake at that point? Well, it was gun wrenching, you know, like at this point you're not taking, you're working for yourself, but you're, you, you have nothing. Like you, I haven't raised money at this point. I'm not taking a salary. I actually went 15 months without taking any salary. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. But that's just living off of savings. Yep. 
or I credit mean, cards get, or whatever. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to get too personal. I just know how things go sometimes. Yeah, no. No, we, we had a period at Harmon Brothers where I lived off of my savings account. Yeah. Just no, total, totally did. That was definitely it. I mean, I had made some money from sales, thankfully. But mm-hmm. yeah, you're... You're, uh, you know, I didn't get to the ramen stage that <laughs> I didn't let myself get there. But at the same time, like it was definitely a struggle. And I think part of it for me, um, uh, we had, we are a product technology company mm-hmm. and it's pretty complex as you can tell. Uh-huh. Um, and so there was a lot that had to be built if we were going to sell into, you know, huge organizations like big broadcasters and media companies and telcos around the world, you had to come in with a sophisticated product and that has happened overnight. Because it has to overnight. plug into a whole bunch of different systems, right? Yes, and it has to work well and with high fidelity and real time and all of these things that have to be key differentiators in the system. Um, and so what does that require? It requires money, right? Yeah. And so the big challenge was that during this time when I was finding new CTOs, is like I couldn't really raise money because I didn't have the team there. They're like, well, you're not going to build it, you know? And so until you have this team stood together, then it kind of puts, um, uh, it makes it very challenging to do anything else yeah. in this space. So fundraising was, you know, it, it's also completely a new journey. Like, um, oh, yeah. what, I, what I tell everyone about my experience so far being an entrepreneur is that you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable uh, like, uh, all the time. All the time. That's all the time. exactly what it is. And um, we, we have yeah. a term for that with, with, our, um, with our videos when we create stuff uh-huh. is just embrace embarrassment. Like yes. that, that's just part of it. Yeah. You just have to constantly be willing to be like, oh, I'm going to put this joke out there. Oh, it didn't land. That was embarrassing. <laughs> now we'll try another one or we'll try this other cut. And you just have to go to that process. But that, I love that. Come get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think for me too, as I said, like this is a quite a technical challenge. And initially when you first start building a company, you know, you go through different types of fundraising rounds, right? And the initial mm-hmm. one is usually called like a friends or family or an angel round. Well, I haven't taken any friends or family money, but um, I did, you know, raise money from uh, angels and mm-hmm. they're usually, you know, successful professionals who, you know, have some money that they can invest in some stuff. Um, and uh, so, you know, y- you might be sitting in front of someone who could be the age of like your grandma or your grandpa and you're trying to explain to them like what I tried to explain to you earlier. Yeah. And they're like, I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. You know? That's the big or, like, thing. When I download uh, one investor that said, when I download real player to my computer and try and watch video. I'm like, oh, my God, uh, no, no, yeah. Video. I'm like, yeah. And they have so, an AOL email address yeah. and stuff. <laughs> yes. Hotmail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's been, it's, it's been an interesting process trying to, and I, I also tell this to pretty much everyone. I think my biggest challenge has been what you try and have to get right is storytelling and storytelling is the biggest challenge you tell stories to your customers about this new product category you're creating and they're trying to wrap their heads around it too they're trying to say but are you competitive to this company uh-huh. Do you have this company and it's like no we, this is how we're different but it's telling that story and continue to tell that story and develop you know uh the nomenclature and the phraseology for what you do with uh your customers with investors um with everyone and uh, it's still something that i try and work on every single day yeah and, and sometimes i'm better at it than others but <laughs> <laughs> it's okay well that's cool it's interesting kind of at the heart of it for you to kind of evangelize and bring people along on this journey and this passion that you have yeah you have to be able to tell a story in a way that it clicks for people yep. and i mean that's so much of what we do right at yeah. Armour brothers that's so much of a tie-in to um everything when the clients approach us like we've got to tell the story we don't know how to do that you know can you guys help us out 100%. um awesome okay so how do you go about guiding a bunch because I'm, I'm assuming your company is made up mostly of tech people right yes how yep. do you go about guiding that when you're not like a coder and, and like and speaking that language and everything? How do you go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think it. Um, I think there's two components to it. I think one is, I think to be a, a founder in, you know, for me a technology company and not having a, a coding background as an example, I had to be really curious. Mm. Like I only discovered the opportunity for DataZoom because I was pretty curious about how things worked and why things were done a certain way. Okay. And, um, you know, I've been in this space now for about five years mm-hmm. and uh, I feel pretty confident about the knowledge that I've gained specifically within the, you know, concepts pertaining to data in the video space. And the only reason why I have this is because I asked a ton of questions and I asked the silly questions at the beginning and yeah. they got slightly more sophisticated over time. Yeah. So I think part of it is you have to be curious. And the second part is... Um, 
I hired people that were way more senior than I was. So I think everyone on my team, with one exception, um, is 15 to 20 years at least my senior. Okay. Right? Wow. So we have a really experienced team doing this. And so I had this like crazy vision for this thing and I found a bandwagon of amazing, highly experienced individuals who have amazing careers and track records to come and build this with me. That's awesome. Um, and I think that's the only way it happens. That's so inspiring. Right? So let me get this straight. And this will maybe, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna try to approach this subject carefully. Let's just put it that way. Okay, so you're, you're young. Yes. And a lot of the people that are working for you are not. Let's just say more senior in age, right? Yes. Yeah, and okay, in an experience. Yes, okay. exactly. And then you're also a woman uh -huh. in a male-dominated industry. Yes. Okay. Talk to me about that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's funny. So I have um, I have a, a mentor and friend mm -hmm. of mine who I met through um, an accelerator program that DataZoom completed uh, in the end of 2017. And... I talked to her a lot about how I was going to find that third CTO that stuck. And of course, like there were not any like women technologists that unfortunately fit the mold that I was looking for. Right. And we talked about this directly. It's like, okay, we need to find someone who feels comfortable with, you know, you being younger mm -hmm. and you not having as much experience as they do and you probably having ideas that are going to be conflicting with theirs and they will still have to follow you at the end of the day yeah you're the visionary yeah yeah and i think um you know when when i first brought on michael who's my cto um when we talked for the first time about what the vision was for DataZoom, within the first 10 minutes, he was like, oh yeah, I totally get this. I have this problem every single day at my current position. He's been working in the video technology space for a long time. Um, he's like, this is a fantastic idea. And then we spent two months kind of like talking and courting each other and talking about vision and communication and all of these fundamental things. And it really set a base layer and it gave us time to kind of see how each other interacted. Um, but I guess fundamentally, uh, it requires just like a ton of respect. Yeah. All, all the way around. Yep. And respect has to be independent of age or experience. Right? I love that. So guys, write that down. <laughs> guys and girls, write that down. <laughs> write Respect that down. has to be independent of and age gender. or experience. Yeah, and gender, and, gender right? and all of it, right? Exactly. So you know that's never been a question from day one, and uh, he is someone that uh, you know we we talk about this from time to time. Like uh, I feel totally supported by him, mm -hmm. you know, and that's also set the stage and the tone for everyone else at the company. And I don't think anyone would have independently had any issue with respecting. Uh, my authority or my position, but it's nice that someone who is kind of the other C-suite at our company, uh, you know, engages me in the same way. Yeah. And I think in terms of like the rest of the rest of the industry, like I've had to weasel my way in there. You yeah. know, in the beginning, I didn't know anyone, yeah. and so you're trying to sell enterprise technology to C-level people at broadcasters and media companies, which is like the broadcast industry is like an old school, like very male dominated industry. And so even though digital has kind of loosened it up a little bit and some newer, younger people have come in, still not been a lot of women that have entered into the space. Um, and there was no way about it other than just like walking into the middle of a group and being like, hi, I'm Diane. Mm -hmm. How are you? Mm -hmm. You know? And, uh, at the beginning, it was kind of difficult because you get yourself in these situations where you didn't want to feel like you didn't know what they were talking about, but you definitely didn't know what you were what they were talking about. Um, but you end up learning, as I said. You ask you ask those questions, and you find people that uh, you can have these conversations with. And over time, you develop these relationships. And I think now I feel pretty like secure about myself and how uh, people see me in this space. And I think people respect, you know my ideas and opinions um but it took a lot of like bull in a china shop kind of approach mm -hmm. to getting in here you know yeah. so it was definitely not something for like the faint, the faint of heart. hearted <laughs> but um surely being a woman in this male dominated space you've had moments of conflict right yeah. um where things have 
Like you, you, you said, you, you described it. Like it's, it's kind of hard going in there. You just kind of have to go in with all the confidence in the world and just put yourself out there. And, yep. and like you said, get comfortable with being un- uncomfortable, right? To some mm-hmm. degree, even like that goes above and beyond entrepreneurship, right? To like gender, gender stereotyping and all that kind of thing. A hundred percent. Anyway, do you have any stories around that you'd like to share? Yeah, I remember, you know, I, it was my first year at uh, NAB a couple, probably four or five years ago now. And I was like in line getting coffee and my title was VP of sales. Let me give some people some context. So NAB is the... The National Association of Broadcasters Conference. Crazy. It's one of the largest uh, conferences in the world. Anyways, uh, I had booth duty and I needed to pick me up. So I went to go grab some coffee and I'm standing in line. And, you know, as I said, my title was a VP of sales. And this guy comes up to me and he goes, oh, uh, what booth are you working at? And asking as if, and actually, I think it was more like... What's it like being a booth babe? Oh. And I was like, that was so offensive about asking <laughs> what booth you were working at. But yeah. <laughs> I see I see now. There's a, a difference. Yeah, and it was like it was kinda like, how would you just assume that I'm not part of your industry that right. I'm just rented for the week uh-huh. to be here? And it was offensive and I think what I've learned is that um, there's, I guess, two, there's two things. Like, in that case, he made an unconscious bias. He had, there's unconscious bias playing into the situation. So uh, I don't think he meant to do any harm. So I basically yeah. just told him, hey, you know, actually, um, I run sales at this company over here. If you want to come check out our booth, be happy to explain more about what we do. You know, there was an intentional malice, whatever you want to call it. Sure. Um, he's he's that, trying to strike up a conversation, but he's doing it from a standpoint of a, yeah. a, kind of a sexist standpoint, right? Yes, 100%. Uh-huh. And then there's instances where, you know, people, uh, yeah, ha- definitely have come up to me and there's been, unfortunately, like instances of uncomfortable uh, cab rides, uncomfortable oh. physical interaction that had to be oh, reported. Yeah. I think one of the big challenges we actually have in this space is actually in across all industries is that uh, we actually have no way to easily report when someone at another company has been interacting inappropriately. Uh, okay, yeah, you can do it within your own company. You have HR or whatever it is that Where you deal with. Where do you start? With. Yeah. Where do you go? Um, and unfortunately, there's been a few times when I wanted to to do that. Um, and then you know, there's so there's things that happen in person. There's things that happen online. It sounds like you're you're coming up with another business idea right now. Yeah, yes. <laughs> After data zoom. Yes, yes. Actually, it's partially in the works. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Um, and I would say the last thing that I think for me has been quite unique is that. Uh, I'm lucky to have a really fantastic family who supports me all mm-hmm. the time and gives me that confidence. And actually I wrote about this, um, I think like a special relationship that I have with my dad. Um, I wrote this article called How to Teach Your Daughter to Be a Tech Entrepreneur. Okay, and oh, that's awesome. I posted that's on sticky LinkedIn. Sticky title. Yeah, and uh, again, like I got an outpour of all of these uh, messages and comments from uh, a lot of men and, and some women and some of them were, you know, private messages like, wow, I read your article. I've been trying to figure out how I deal with some of these issues. But I talk about how, you know, one of them is bring this stuff to the like out into the open. Like my dad talked about how um, in the tech space, there is a huge gender gap. Right. And oh, so yeah. he put that issue on the table. And therefore, I felt comfortable talking to him about that and bringing some of these situations to him. Like, what should I do? You know, yeah. like one of those times when uh, I've been uncomfortable uh, and there was, you know, inappropriate physical contact was unfortunately in a position where I was trying to make a sale. And this is a partner that I needed to close a deal. Right. So, like, what do you do in those what situations? What do you do? Like, That's that is so awkward. Terrible, it's terrible. Yeah. So, yeah, I think being able to have this, uh, you know, open dialogue with my dad was really beneficial to me being able to handle some of the uniqueness of being a woman, a woman in a man's world in this sense, at least today. And I, I hope that some of the things that we're doing uh, in women in streaming media uh, can help, you know, change that. I hope that other women in leadership positions can help set examples so more women want to come into the space and grow and we give more visibility to everyone. Good for you and good for your dad. That's awesome. Thanks, thanks. Thank you so much for, for joining us today yeah. or joining me and us and all <laughs> and everybody. But I have a gift for you, Diane. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, 
So here's our book from Poop to Gold. Lovely. <laughs> uh, the Marketing <laughs> Magic of Harmon Brothers. And um, awesome. for, for those of you that want to um, look that up, that's on harmonbrothersbook.com. But this is also from our clients yes. if you're into that kind of stuff. But um, awesome. this has been a lot of fun, very enlightening, and I appreciate you taking time out um, to do this with us. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And thank you guys for watching. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, comment, share, all that good stuff. And we'll see you on the next one.